unfortunately, obviously a lot of these sites became associated with the devil at some point because they were clearly seen as anathema to the Christian faith. And I think it's also important to point, to point out that, um, that a large amount of these stones were actually torn down and either buried by people from medieval times onwards to the 18th century. Um, or they were they were either buried or they were broken up. And when they were broken up, basically what they would do is that they would build fires around them and then quickly throw water onto them and crack them and eventually fracture them and break them up. And the same very all into pieces. Um, I mean they they would try and do one a year. Seriously, they would try and do one every year to get rid of them. Um, particularly when you got, came into the 17th century and you had the Puritans and they obviously were, you know, not just trying to clean up all of the papered stuff but all of the, the idolatry inside churches, of course, you know, make them just plain white inside with nothing inside, no, you know, idolatrous uh, imagery and statues or anything. So obviously they hated the megaliths and that's what they would try and do. And even... Um, in the 18th century, the antiquarian William Stukeley, who did a lot uh, The moon circle is considered to be that one, where we were with the cove, and the sun circle, probably because it's closer to, to the path of the sun, the movement of the sun, is considered to be this southern circle, with this being the centre. So that means, to be honest, this is but as I said, this is this was a huge great monolith that you know that, that obviously would have dominated this site and, and may just have pre-existed the the actual henge itself. Was it because like a, an the cove, if the cove pre-existed the you know the main henge and the main circle, then the chances are this monolith did as well. Sorry, sir. Was it like an Egyptian obelisk? Uh, well, I mean, it, it could have functioned in the same way, definitely. You know, I mean, big, yeah, it looked it, well. It, it was a bit fatter than the Russian model, but oh, still, it. it was still. Yeah. Oh, it was. A, it, I mean, in other words, it was like the Russian model, which I think Graham showed the picture of yesterday, but much fatter, and probably much, therefore, much large, larger in, in volume and mass, basically. I think Terence worked it out as well that you could, uh, if it was so tall, you could see it. If you were on the top of silver, you could glove although this one's got holes it's got fingers and fingerless but you know this is just a piece of linen put together in it there's nothing is it that's not alive but if I wear that glove it's animated okay and that's what plasma is like you know it's not the plasma that's alive it's what occupies it that makes it come alive okay and these intelligences probably come from what David Bowen, who I didn't realise was a friend of Robert Temple, said comes from a deeper level of, of, of existence. Uh, he called this other realm the implicate order. But other people have called it pre-space. The quantum field is a, a very popular term today, but it's somewhere outside of normal three-dimensional space with one dimension of time. And it has been proposed that plasma itself could have an extra dimension within it. Now, whether this is an extra dimension of space or something else, we don't know. And that by virtue of that, it could act as a portal or a conduit into some other higher dimensional uh, existence or realm. And there are answers to this in M theory, for instance, which is a form of string theory where it talks about before the physical universe was created, there was something that referred to as the bumps. The bumps. This was an 11 dimensional realm that pre-existed the physical universe and that within that bulk suddenly opens up within it like a balloon or a bubble forming would be a physical universe with its own laws of physics. In our case, three dimensions of, time, of space, one dimension of time. But the other of these bubbles or balloons 
blowing up inside them could have different laws of physics, maybe another dimension of space or something quite different. And what they call these bubbles, if you like, are brains, B-R-A-N-E, as in membrane, okay? These are brains. And these brains can touch each other, this is what's been theorized, or overlap with each other. And if they overlap with each other, then we could be overlapping with, with a, another physical existence, let's say physical, in our sense, that could interact with us under certain conditions. And those conditions, I think, are plasma environments. Plasma is created when you have what's known as an ionospheric environment. What this means is that the Earth itself produces natural electricity, which electricity is essentially just the flow of subatomic particles known as electrons, and they break the surface, they rise up, and they change the existing electrostatic fields that exist naturally. In other words, they intensify to create what's known as an ionospheric environment. And when this happens, it's like a tinderbox for the production of plasma. And the geology of a place is important to this because that geology produces the electricity. Now, I won't go into all the different types of of uh, geology that creates it, but the most well-known one is piezoelectricity. Uh, and this is caused through the squashing of certain types of rock, generally associated with fault lines, you know, that split within the underlying rock. You can go down miles, basically. And this generates a lot of electricity and creates ionospheric fields, and particularly before earthquakes. I mean, for instance, the, the, the terrible earthquakes in Turkey, February this year, um, just before they occurred, lights were seen. We were in Turkey in May, he's nodding, Gary's nodding there, uh, who's there, Maria, and, and we were, you know, going along the road, and I was telling this sort of story, basically, and somebody said, oh, does that, oh, that's right, and we, we, we heard, that, that strange lights have been seen above Gaziantep airport. Closed the, closed the whole airport down for 12 hours as they investigated what, what the hell these strange lights were. And bear in mind that Gaziantep was one of the centers of the earthquake a few months earlier. And so somebody in the bus said, um, does that mean there's gonna be another earthquake? I said, no, no, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And then Gary came up about an hour later and said, oh my God, there's just been an earthquake in the very area, just to prove the point. And we were actually on the, on the bus in the very area where the earthquake took place. But because we were in the bus, we didn't feel it because we probably just thought it was the shaking of the bus or something. So we didn't actually feel anything. It wasn't a big one, by the way. Um, and so in other words, the earth creates these lights. And from the point of view of Avery, there are fault lines just to the south, Pusey Downs all the way along it. We don't know whether there are any fault lines beneath Avery itself, but what you have got is aquifers and a lot of chalk. And that chalk holds a lot of water, and water is a perfect conduit of, of, um, of electrons. Um, and this is another form of producing um, you know, electricity, natural energy within the, the Earth. And what we know is that Avery, as I've mentioned earlier, has been a centre focus of strange activity, UFOs, weird lights, what we call UAP today. And I mean, here's just one example. There was a lady who unfortunately died recently by the name of Heather Garland. She lived in the high street. Uh, she was almost like a guardian of, of Avery. Um, very pleasant lady. Spoke to many occasions. I actually recorded a, a video of her, which you know, for, for future use. And she was out walking one night in this particular quadrant of the Henge with her dog. It was dark. Uh, it was in uh, a winter night, and she saw this 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 ball of light suddenly come towards her, and from the direction of Silbury Hill, which is over there, and it came over and it actually just drifted down and entered the ground right close to where we are. 
I mean, just a, a huge globe of light. Now that's plasma, no question at all in my opinion. That's plasma, and it goes into the ground, right in front of us. And there are other similar cases of people seeing these globes. And there's one, quite disturbing one, um, where somebody supposedly saw a globe uh, appear uh, here, and this weird, huge, monster-like slug thing came out of it and completely frightened the life out of her and you know she got out of it and this is in uh, a book I, I can't remember at the moment but I remember reading this and think that's interesting because oh, it, oh, as bizarre as this story is it's in the very area where Heather Garland also saw her life and it was in this quadrant that myself and my ex-wife Sue actually also witnessed something odd it's the only, one of the only things that we saw whilst we were actually here we were we were walking through the hedge we, we came into uh, into this section here and i saw this this burst of light come from from one of the stones just just to the, the right here and it was blue and it, it was the color of a police light but it was diffuse. It looked like it was inside a perfect box or stone in its own right. So it's quite diffuse. And of course, obviously I was allergic to this. I thought, I'm going to go straight to our front. Went over there, nobody there. You know, and I, obviously I'm trying to work out in my head, could somebody have done something and got away quickly, but it seems very, very unlikely. So, it, and this was like a burst, because the thing about plasma is that it can be sustained creates its own magnetic field that can be sustained for a short while but it can also only exist for a fraction of a second in other words it can be produced and then it just dissipates very quickly so in other words all it would appear is a flash of light that's all you'd be seeing breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth <coughs> And as you do that, I want you to feel as if light is coming in through your nose, filling your body. And as you're breathing out, any kind of a sort of dirty light, almost like a smoke is coming out, as if any impurities within your body is going, coming out. So you're filling your body, almost like a bottle being filled with light. And any impurities in your body is coming out as a dirty smoky light coming out of your mouth and the more you do this the more your body is filled with light like a bottle being filled with liquid light going all the way down to your toes upwards through your legs upwards through your body down through your arms into your hands and upwards into your neck into your head so that your whole entire body is filled with light and I want you now just to start pushing that out around you in other words going out into your aura from Pemble talked about this before, put it out into your aura push it out upwards downwards into the ground and outwards in front of you, behind you, side. Obviously be aware that everybody else is doing that. And this light is beginning to join us all together, reaching out. But at the same time I now want you to visualize a light appearing in the center of our circle. It's getting brighter and brighter. The more we focus on it, the more this group focuses on that light, the bigger that central ball of light is becoming and is reaching out towards us and gradually beginning to push its way through us so that we become like points of consciousness within this huge ball of light that surrounds all of us it becomes a beacon at this site for the genius loci, the spirit of this place, the inherent sentience or intelligence of this place. Feel our light going outwards now, almost like spokes of a wheel, 
into the rest of the hinge. Feel it going out to the edges of the earthen embankment, the ditch, right the way through the high street, across the road into where the cove is, where the first seat is, where the Tolkien tree is, into the other quadrant where we were, we were talking about UFOs. Feel that light going out into every part so that it fills the whole of the hedge. And this is bringing alive this place. But it's also awakening the ancestors and those would have been the beings that the ancients who came here would have been trying to communicate with. So we ask those ancestors of the past 